The first stone tools, so-called Mode 1 tools, were pebbles with a few bits roughly knocked off to create a sharp edge. They were in use from 2 million years ago. Then 300,000 years ago, Mode 2 tools came into use. These were symmetrically shaped hand axes and represented a leap forward in efficiency. Whereas Mode 1 tools provided 3 inches of cutting edge for a pound of flint, Mode 2 tools provided 4 times as much, 12 inches of cutting edge for a pound of flint. Around 100,000 years ago, there was a new breakthrough with the invention of Mode 3 tools. With Mode 2, you chipped flakes from a core and what was left was the tool. With Mode 3, this was reversed and it was the flakes that became the tool. This made it possible to get 30 inches of cutting edge for a pound of flint, 10 times as much as Mode 1. Finally, 30,000 years ago, Mode 4 or blade technologies came in. Mode 4 involved more careful preparation of the core and produced not 30 inches, but 30 feet of cutting edge for every pound of flint. If Stone Age people had plotted these figures on a graph, they would have got this, a hockey stick, a long, slow development, then seemingly sudden takeoff. We see such graphs nowadays representing things like population growth and technological evolution, and they imply that our era is very different, that for most of history there was virtually no change to speak of, whereas we who are alive today happen to have been born in a time when change is rapid and dramatic. Yet now we see that people in the Stone Age could have said the same, that things were just taking off in their time. History can be thought of as self-similar, like a fractal. In a classic fractal, like a fern leaf, the same pattern repeats on larger and larger scales. And in history, the same patterns recur in ever more grandiose ways. The hockey stick of technology growth turns out to be made of hockey sticks within hockey sticks. When you have an iPhone, Stone tools can look pretty lame, and most of us wouldn't know the difference from a casual glance at a museum cabinet. But when stone tools are all you have, what seem to us like minor improvements can take on tremendous significance. What's more, the developments in stone tools we have considered so far were all in the old Stone Age or Paleolithic. There were even bigger leaps forward in the Mesolithic, with the invention of tiny microliths and carefully shaped arrowheads. In the Neolithic, with the development of polished stone tools. And then with the discovery of metals, copper, bronze, and then iron. Each of these waves of innovation would have seemed like a rapid and dramatic upward movement compared to what had gone before at the time. So today we are experiencing rapid technological development, but in comparative terms, every age could have said the same. This is something that makes the present more like the past, not less like it. Instead of concluding from today's outpouring of innovation, that things are coming to some kind of crunch or culmination, we should conclude that things are continuing in much the same way as before. Yes, today's advances are more rapid than ever, but that is because we live at the forward edge of time. Today, as in any era, change is faster than it was, but not as fast as it will become. Already in the 18th century, the pottery manufacturer Josiah Wedgwood said that the pace of change was such as to make him giddy. We cope with a faster pace of change than he did, and there is no reason to think that people won't be able to cope with even faster changes in future. The pace of change is accelerating, not because we are somehow cleverer than our ancestors, but just because there are more people around to come up with ideas. It took 70,000 years to go from mode 3 to mode 4 stone tools, increasing efficiency by a factor of 10, 
but in those days there were only about a million people on the planet. Today there are approaching 10 billion people on the planet, that's 10,000 times as many. We should expect innovations to come at 10,000 times the rate. In other words, we should expect tenfold improvements in efficiency every seven years, not 70,000. To put it another way, back in the Stone Age with a million people on the planet, we accumulated a million person years of human creativity every year. Today, with 10 billion people on the planet, we accumulate 10 billion person years of human creativity every year. If we plot technology against years, we of course get this accelerating graph. But if we plot technology not against years, but against person years, i.e. if we plot the fruits of human creativity against the amount of human creativity that has occurred, we might get something that looks more like steady growth at a constant rate. It's not quite as simple as that. Some of our innovations may have themselves boosted human creativity, like printing. When Alexander Fleming discovered the antibiotic properties of penicillin in 1928, no one paid much attention, and he himself didn't have the chemical knowledge to do anything about it. It was only ten years later that the chemist Ernst Kine happened to be browsing an old journal, read Fleming's paper, and went on to turn penicillin into a viable medical technology. As the 18th century French writer Antergo pointed out, in the Stone Age, if a person didn't get to pass on their idea, it would die with them. But after the invention of writing, and particularly after the invention of printing, ideas could be transmitted more easily across time and space to others who might be ready to take them up. So ideas come faster and technology grows faster, not just because there are more people, but also because there is more technology. In other words, technology should grow faster than population, and the rate of advance today should, if anything, be even more explosive than our simple calculation suggests. The fact remains that the era of innovation we are living through is not a new or unusual experience for the human race, but is entirely predictable and in line with what has gone before. This is not a special time in history where technology has suddenly taken off, but a perfectly normal time. If we find that hard to imagine and assume we are coming to some kind of crunch, it is because we don't see how people can travel to other star systems or solve environmental problems by taking control of the Earth's climate. But our current state of ignorance is not a good argument for saying that these things, or others we haven't thought of yet, are really impossible. Today's technology may seem dramatic and exciting to us, but one day it will blend into the long history of technological evolution and belong to the dull, flat, quiet, relatively unchanging part of the graph. Now, while technology as a whole may develop exponentially, individual technologies do not. We don't really use stone tools anymore. Their technological evolution has come to an end. Or take the sewing needle. Humans' first attempts at sewing made use of a pointed flint called a burin. This drilled a hole and the thread was pushed through. The burin evolved into the slender needle, with an eye for the thread, originally of bone, now of steel. This technology reached perfection some 30,000 years ago, and apart from minor improvement in materials, has hardly changed since. It seems that individually, technologies undergo rapid improvements at first, but this tails off and they reach a stage of maturity characterised by diminishing marginal returns. Instead of climbing ever upwards, they follow an S-shaped curve that is known as logistic growth. The key technologies of today, like the internet and the smartphone, may already be entering the stage of maturity or not far off it. Moore's law the rule that computer chip efficiency doubles every 18 months seems to be coming to an end, and perhaps with it the whole information technology revolution.
Smartphones went through a rapid development from the early 2000s with the first incorporation of cameras, mobile data and GPS, but today it tends to look like more of the same. I can imagine a few more things I'd like on my phone, like a radiation detector, but perhaps this technology is reaching maturity. It's the right size and shape and it does pretty much all we could want. With email, social networking, video sharing, online commerce, blogging, the internet may already do most of the things it will ever do. We could come back in hundreds of years time and still recognise it, just as a Stone Age person would recognise the modern needle. Accelerating growth will continue, but in some other branch of technology. Can I free white coffee? Yeah, nice to you. Would you like any sugar, sir? Uh, no, that's fine. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you very much. The Russian theoretical historian Leonid Grinin suggests that there have been four basic production principles, as he refers to them, since the emergence of the human race around 40,000 years ago. And these reflect four great waves of innovation. The first he calls the hunter-gatherer cycle, when humans lived directly off the land. The second he calls the craft agrarian, which involved the invention of agriculture and when people relied on human and animal power. The third wave was the industrial, with the development of machines. And the fourth wave he calls the information scientific, with an emphasis on ingenuity over brute force. Each of these waves has been shorter than the last. The hunter-gatherer lasted around 30,000 years, from 40,000 to 8,000 BC. The craft agrarian lasted nine and a half thousand years, from 8,000 BC to AD 1430, i.e. the invention of the printing press. The industrial lasted 500 years, from 1430 to 1955, i.e. the adoption of the transistor. And the information scientific is still in progress, but Grinin expects it to end around 2100 for a duration of 150 years. Despite the different timescales, Grinin argues that every wave has gone through the same six stages, which he calls transitional, adolescence, fluorescence, maturity, high maturity and preparatory, i.e. preparing for the next wave. As far as the present wave is concerned, he has an upper and lower estimate of the timings of the different stages. Either way, according to him, we are currently in stage two of the information scientific wave, and it will give way to the next stage in 2040, according to the upper estimate, or 2030, according to the lower estimate. By Grinin's theory, our time as stage two of the present production principle would have the same feel and characteristics as stage two of the preceding production principle, i.e. the industrial cycle. Stage two for the industrial cycle corresponds to the period between 1630 and 1730. This was when scientific discoveries were developing understanding of mechanics, chemistry and the study of heat. But before the introduction of the steam engine and before the herding of population, from the farms into the factories of the Industrial Revolution. In other words, it was a time that laid the groundwork for what was to come, but when the far-reaching transformation of society caused by industrialization, involving changes in the nature of work and a great increase in the pace of life, still lay in the future. In the same way, the time we are living through with the arrival of the internet and mobile computing can be regarded as just a preliminary phase of the current innovation wave. We are impressed by today's technology, but we have not seen anything yet. We may think the change has been dramatic, but children still go to school, adults go to work by car, bus and train, towns have high streets lined with shops. From a distance, things don't seem much different from the way they were 30 or even 50 years ago. You have to get close up to see the smartphones and the snapchatting and the web surfing. The real transformation of society, the wholesale displacement of human activity,
the very visible and unmistakable evidence that we have entered a new historical epoch, all that is still to come in the time after 2030 or 2040. It seems it is going to involve two themes in particular. First, the elimination of many existing jobs as they are taken over by artificial intelligence. Second, the levelling up of the human race to the next step of our adventure as we stop being a species confined to a planetary surface and begin the transition to a space-based civilization. I think there is probably a third theme too, and that is the spread of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and technologies related to cryptocurrency. But that deserves a video in its own right, and I won't talk any more about it here. But let's step back a bit. We hear a lot of negative things about today's technology. A common complaint is that it has made us antisocial because we are always on our phones and ignoring the people around us. Another is that it has given everyone short attention spans. We don't concentrate on our work because we are constantly checking our emails or Facebook or reading clickbait news. We flick from site to site and video to video, skimming and seldom viewing anything from start to finish. The concern is that as a result, people, especially young people, don't really know anything anymore. And it's not just the person in the street saying this, it seems to be backed up by scientific studies which demonstrate, for example, that people don't absorb information from the internet as well as they do from a book, and what they do absorb doesn't stay in their memory. Why bother remembering things when you can look them up on Google? And critics say that's all very well, but if people don't know anything, how can they tell fact from fiction? Won't their ignorance make them susceptible to manipulation and misinformation? But would we really be better off if we gave up the internet and went back to public libraries and telephone landlines? These criticisms of today's technology are best seen as moral panics, symptoms of people's concerns about a changing world which inevitably involves the loss of some older skills and activities as we take on new ones. From a historical perspective the concerns are somewhat familiar. In the early 19th century there were complaints about people having their heads stuck in books as cheaper printing meant that books were becoming more widely available as well as light and disposable enough to take on your travels. Earlier in the 18th century people complained that the newspaper had put an end to conversation in coffee shops. An internet meme shows a railway carriage full of people absorbed in their newspapers. Today's railway carriage does not look so socially isolating in comparison. The internet cartoonist XKCD sums it up with a comic strip in which someone complains about the antisocial nature of books, newspapers and magazines, TV and the Sony Walkman, ending with the suggestion, it's time we got the message. Yes, people may now look at their phones in restaurants when in the past they would have had to make polite conversation, but the reality is that people remain highly sociable beings. The technology just allows them to connect in other ways, and that is what makes it so absorbing. People loved newspapers and books, and today they love the internet, because these information technologies open their horizons to a wider world of thoughts, events and ideas. And that connection to the wider world rather than simply talking with friends and neighbours whose stories and opinions you already know, has been hugely beneficial to human creativity and the expansion of knowledge. When it comes to an erosion of people's ability to remember, the Greek philosopher Socrates was already complaining about this two and a half thousand years ago. For him, it was the invention of writing that meant people no longer carried factual knowledge in their heads. There was truth in what he said, but on the other hand, by being written down, information could be preserved and shared more easily. People might no longer wrote memorise lists of facts, but they had meta-knowledge instead. 
rather than knowing the names and dates of all the kings, they knew the concept of a king list and where to find one, and then they could look up specific facts if and when they needed them. Echoing today's concerns in another way, Socrates said that when someone tells you something, you can look them in the eye and question them and decide whether you believe them. But when you read something in a book, you can't do that, and you may believe it when it isn't true. Now people say the same thing about the internet, about Wikipedia, for example, about it being untrustworthy and capable of misleading people. However, the French revolutionary writer Marquis de Condorcet argued it the opposite way. He said that it's when access to knowledge is controlled by a few people that it's easier to spread false information. According to him, this was the role of priests throughout history, keeping the masses in fear and ignorance so they could be controlled more easily. But writing, and even more printing, democratised access to knowledge so that more people would be able to check it and the quality of knowledge has increased. Today we have the institution of peer review for academic papers and in a print culture genuinely false information cannot survive for long. The historian Elizabeth Eisenstein says that the invention of the printing press was directly related to the rise of modern science, replacing the confused belief systems of earlier times. And with the internet, yes, there is a lot of flaky stuff online, but it's usually pretty easy to check it and find someone debunking it. The internet can be said to promote critical thinking. Not only is there a service like Snopes.com giving critical analysis of wacky news stories and urban legends, but there are also sites criticising Snopes and deconstructing its agendas. Another way of thinking about today's information technology is that people practise a mode of thinking that is just in time, not just in case. When you get a new piece of equipment today, you don't read all through the manual. You get started and if you have a question, you just Google it. Instead of learning things just in case you might need them, you use the power of the internet to look them up when it becomes relevant, learning just in time what you need to know. And it doesn't matter that you don't remember what you learned because it may not be relevant anymore, or if it is, you can easily look it up again. This is a more efficient use of your cognitive resources. People only have finite mental capacities and instead of filling their heads with facts, they have meta-knowledge on a much greater scale than ever before. They have short attention spans because there are so many demands on their attention, and when it is so easy to research and retrieve information, it makes sense to keep a shallow overview of a wide range of topics rather than get bogged down in details of a narrow one. When people surf the web, jumping quickly from link to link and site to site, they are maintaining awareness of a complex information environment. This is not a problem. It is precisely as it should be. It is humans who are highly competent survival directed beings, or they would not have got as far as they have, evolving new information consumption strategies to suit the changed realities of the World Wide Web and multimodal access portals that are always in their hands. The futurist Kevin Kelly compares web surfing with the process of dreaming, which appears to be important for creativity. Many people have found that problems become easier to solve after sleeping on them. The bizarre and random imagery of dreams seems to be about letting the brain run free to make new connections and see things in different ways. Like actual dreaming, click dreaming can look aimless and a waste of time, but it acts on the unconscious as an aid to imagination, giving people more thoughts to draw on and link together, and providing inspiration for new ideas. As throughout history, the technology is a multiplier, further enhancing the very creativity that made it possible. 
a particularly huge multiplier, a particularly huge augmentation of human capabilities, is going to come about through AI, artificial intelligence. News stories are already appearing of human workers being replaced by AI. In the past, people tended to worry about what would happen to the least skilled workers in a world full of robots. In the so-called 2080 scenario, it was imagined that only a small, intelligent and creative elite would work, while the rest of humanity would be useless and unemployed, a drain on society living out a pointless existence. But AI is actually taking over white-collar and skilled, highly paid roles. Currency traders, for example, perform a complex and esoteric task that requires strong nerves, quick timing and understanding of some specialised concepts and relationships. Traditionally, they have earned big salaries and big bonuses for their work. But everything they do can be done better by computer, and it seems it won't be long before these Porsche-driving city high-flyers are on the scrap heap. One study suggests that 35% of jobs will have been taken over by robots in the next 20 years. But this doesn't mean that people will be sitting around with nothing to do. In the past, technology has created more jobs than it destroyed. Otherwise, the human population would not have been able to grow the way it has and still remain employed. When the motor car came in, it took away the jobs of horse dealers and stable hands, but it created jobs as car dealers and garage attendants. Once, almost everyone worked on farms. Now, only 1% do. Instead, people do jobs that didn't exist hundreds of years ago, and life has become richer while the whole activity of society has moved to a higher level. And insofar as technology tends to take over drudgery, i.e. physical and repetitive work, jobs also become, if anything, safer, more pleasant and more interesting. Nevertheless, it's not the case that the displacement of people from one kind of work to another occurs simply and easily. Stable hands did not necessarily want to become garage attendants. They had to lose their jobs and then, with no other options, be forced to find employment in the new industries that were springing up. Change can be uncomfortable, especially when it is forced upon you, and people have to be dragged kicking and screaming from the old world into the new. Some people may never make the change. Jobs can be a source of social identity, and miners who were thrown out of work in the Thatcher years struggled to find a new purpose in life in offices and working with computers. The change occurs anyway as the older generation dies off and is replaced by the younger generation that has never known anything else. Nevertheless, the wholesale arrival of AI in a couple of decades may be accompanied by social turmoil with economic recessions and political conflict as people are made to reinvent themselves but also a boom as whatever new industries come into existence undergo dramatic expansion. Some commentators think that we are not just at risk of losing our jobs. They argue that technology is on a runaway trajectory and in particular that AI will soon exceed human capacities and once that happens it will be able to build a better AI which can build an even better AI and soon the AI will have taken over, leaving humans as a largely irrelevant footnote to the conquest of the cosmos, if not completely eradicated as a species. This technological explosion has been called the singularity, and the futurist Ray Kurzweil suggests that it will occur around the middle of the 21st century, just two or three decades from now. Stephen Hawking has said that AI is potentially humanity's biggest threat. The astronomer Martin Rees has suggested this could be our final century. The problem with these predictions is that they involve this idea that we live in a special era when everything changes. Yet, as we have seen, we can draw hockey stick curves of runaway progress as far back as the Stone Age. In abstract terms, there is nothing really different about today. Humanity has gone through century after century of dramatic changes and many disasters. 
it's quite a leap to suggest that this is our final century. It's like saying that when humanity has been pulling a green ball out of the sack century after century, i.e. coping with all the changes and disasters that litter our, our history, this time it's going to be a red ball. While we don't know what's in the sack and anything's possible, the best bet is that it is actually going to be another green ball. Fears that technology is taking over were already being expressed in the early 20th century in Fritz Lang's Metropolis and Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, where the machine is evil and destructive, while ordinary people have become its slaves. The theme is also found in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein a hundred years earlier. After Frankenstein has brought his monster to life, he is horrified at what he has done and tries to kill it again. But in the night it appears at his bedside. The message is that it is too late. The technology has taken on a life of its own in a way that is sinister and threatening to its creator. A metaphor for the rise of science and the machine in Mary Shelley's time. In reality, technology does not have a life of its own, even though it may seem like that. The Luddites destroyed machines, but it wasn't the machines that were eliminating their jobs. It was the mill owners, the entrepreneurs, who were prepared to invest in the machines as being cheaper and better than human labourers. The role that technology plays in human affairs is not foreordained, but is shaped by social, political and economic processes and pressures. Let's take an example. The printing press, by expanding access to knowledge, is supposed to have made elites more accountable and promoted the growth of democracy. Fair enough. But they had the printing press in Nazi Germany. They have the printing press in North Korea. The technology does not make anything inevitable. It all depends on how society uses it. And the printing press that empowers ordinary people can also empower the government, providing it with improved means of surveillance and control. The effects of technology are not inherent in the technology, but depend on human decision making. And humans are an incredibly resourceful and creative species who way back in the Stone Age were already building the Egyptian pyramids. One only needs to take a reality check to appreciate that people are not going to stand passively by while computers take over. If things looked like they were moving in that direction, they would pull the plug. In any case, it's far from clear that intelligent machines are going to work like that. In 1997, IBM's Deep Blue computer beat Garry Kasparov at chess, the first time a world chess champion had lost to a computer. It might have looked like game over for the human race. What could be the point in playing chess anymore? In fact, more people are playing chess than ever. And what's more, they are better at it than before. Today's world chess champion has the highest ranking in history. Computer chess gives people an opponent who is always available, can be adjusted to suit your ability level, and doesn't mind if you play the same side over and over or abandon games that aren't going your way. In other words, it's a lot easier to play and practice. And the best chess players in the world today are actually neither humans nor computers, but so-called centaurs, human computer teams that play in specialised tournaments. So the chess computer has not made human chess players redundant. It has augmented them, helped them reach new heights. And this is a more reasonable model of how AI will impact other areas of human affairs. Like every previous technology, it will boost human capabilities, taking over many traditional activities while freeing people to explore new opportunities. And indeed, people need AI to help them, precisely because the world has got more complex. We hear people complaining about the rapid pace of change, about information overload, about the vast number of emails, messages and posts clamouring for their attention. Well, AI is the answer. It speeds up our tasks. It prioritises our messages. It makes suggestions for things we might be interested in. 
This has been the effect of technology throughout history. It makes our world faster, richer and more varied, and it provides the tools for coping with this increase in richness and fluidity. So what is happening today is consistent with what has happened before, and there is no justification for making the giant leap to claim that this time it is the end, that the sky will fall in and humanity will be wiped out. So let me give you some advice. This guy is an astronomer, and if you have questions about astronomy, I'm sure he would be very good at answering them. But if you want to find out about history, society and social change, don't waste your time. None of this is to say that there are not tremendous changes ahead. There are, as big as those of the Industrial Revolution, as well as more rapid. Let me discuss one example that I know well. Up to the present, a military headquarters has been populated with dozens of people whose job is to collect information from the troops, provide briefings to the commander, and turn the commander's decisions into practical orders for dissemination back to the troops. This is precisely the kind of activity that can be automated. In the past, all you had was a radio, and you needed people to send and receive. In the future, you will have GPS tracking everyone's position, live streaming, and AI providing analysis and advice while automatically performing routine tasks like reordering supplies. And the picture that is built up in the headquarters can just as easily be transmitted back to those on the front line, cutting out everyone in the middle. All these people can disappear, and the headquarters will be reduced to one person, the commander, with his laptop. And down at the front line you also won't need all the people you had in the past. Today, the Royal Air Force already operates pilotless drones on overseas battlefields from bunkers in the UK. In the future, other aircraft, along with tanks and ships, will go the same way. And these too could be largely automated, so an entire fighting force could consist of just the commander, his laptop, and a whole collection of robots. More realistically, the weapons platforms, tanks, aircraft and ships will be controlled remotely. But there's no obvious need for these human operators to be located at military bases. They can communicate with the platforms and with each other over online networks, which means they could work from home and perhaps be part-timers. Someone could be hunting submarines in the Indian Ocean while sitting at home and bouncing a toddler on her knee. There is also the possibility of crowdsourcing. This has been used for things like classifying galaxies and devising better traffic management schemes. The US Navy has used crowdsourcing to develop new approaches to combating piracy. In future, the general public might be invited to solve military problems, critiquing plans and injecting ideas. The technology will not only eliminate routine tasks, but make it possible to draw on a wider range of inputs for the creative tasks. It will boost the speed and originality of military operations. Nevertheless, many jobs will disappear in the military and other walks of life. Contributing to crowdsourcing projects does not seem much of an alternative career. Where are all these people going to go? The answer is up there, space. Just as the last 25 years have seen mobile phones and the internet go from virtually nowhere to being part of everyday life, so the next 25 years will see space go from being a remote minority activity to something that touches everybody. The website of Blue Origin, the space company founded by Jeff Bezos, the man behind Amazon, states that its vision is of millions of people living and working in space. That, though many people might find it hard to believe, is precisely what is going to happen. When someone with the vision and entrepreneurship of Jeff Bezos commits himself to such a project, it has to be taken seriously. And he is by no means the only one. Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Google, these are some of the leading names in the emerging era of private space exploration. And behind them are numerous smaller startups and research teams. 
Elon Musk's SpaceX company, the first private company to send a craft to the International Space Station, has announced plans to send two fee-paying passengers, space tourists in other words, on a journey around the moon and back, taking them further from Earth than any human has gone before. This is due to happen in 2018, and while there may be glitches and delays, it reveals the ambition of the private space business. Some of the teams competing for Google's Lunar X Prize for the first private probes to reach the moon emphasise that they are heading to the moon not out of mere scientific curiosity, but to scout out commercial opportunities, particularly mining. All five teams are due to launch by the end of this year, 2017. This is happening. The vast expansion of the human presence in outer space is already underway, though it has yet to impinge on the consciousness of most of the general public. Humans need to get into space if they are going to have any kind of reasonable future. It is well known that we are bumping up against the limits of this little planet we currently inhabit. The situation is probably not as serious as the doom mongers suggest. As Antoine de saint exupery the French aviator and author of Le Petit Prince, observed, people who live on the ground have an exaggerated view of the impact of humans on this planet. They live in towns and travel along roads to get from place to place, so they never leave the built environment. But when you are in a plane and look downwards, you appreciate that towns and roads are just patches and threads of concrete in a world that is still mostly green and natural. What's more, the oceans, the largest part of our planet, remain largely unexploited as habitats, farms and sources of raw materials. Nevertheless, we are talking about hockey sticks here. If the recent hockey stick explosion in population and capability like all previous hockey sticks, is to be reduced to triviality by humanity's future development. This can only be achieved by us expanding into the cosmos. The alternative is what people call sustainability, another word for stagnation, the human race stabilising around its current level of population and scientific technological development. Because, let's be clear, the human race could not achieve so-called sustainability and still advance in science and technology. If you look at existing sustainable societies like those of the Australian Aborigines or Amazonian Indians, they are never going to invent computers and iPhones while practicing their sustainable lifestyles. Even if you had put Steve Jobs into an Amazon village, he could not have produced iPhones because the iPhone depends on a vast array of other products and services, not only computer chips and touchscreens, but also the commercial distribution networks that can bring these products together, the electrical grid that powers the factories, the mobile communications infrastructure that allows iPhones to connect, and all the apps and websites that make iPhone ownership worthwhile. There just aren't enough people in an Amazon village to make it happen, even if they had the know-how. If you worked out all the things that go into putting an iPhone in a consumer's hands, you would end up with a requirement for millions of people. And the fact that it takes the efforts of millions of people makes an iPhone very expensive. If you could only sell a hundred iPhones to the people in the village, you would never be able to recoup your costs at a price they could afford. The iPhone is only viable because there are many millions of people who want to buy it. So if the Amazonian Indians wanted iPhones, they could not keep their village lifestyle. They would have to expand their population and impact on the planet dramatically. They would move from sustainability to massive growth. On the other hand, if they wish to remain in their small and sustainable rainforest communities, they must necessarily remain at their current low technological level. What is true of the Amazonians would be true of the planet as a whole if we shifted from growth to sustainability. Our technological endowment would plateau at those technologies it is possible to support 
from the perspective of both production and market size, on a small, isolated planet with a population of 10 billion or so. And we can say that these technologies are pretty much the ones we've already achieved, because not only does the population size determine what technologies are viable, but the technology determines what population size is viable. The technology of the Amazon Indians who live off forest foods would not work for a city of a million people. That number of people would eat everything in sight in no time and everyone would starve to death. Such a city can only exist with agriculture and advanced transport networks and economic institutions to get the food from producers to consumers. To have the globalised economy that makes the iPhone viable requires the very communications capabilities that technology like the iPhone provides. So our technology represents not only what is possible, but also what is necessary. If we transition to sustainability at this particular size and scale, we will experience no more technological breakthroughs. The technologies that are viable at the present size and scale of population we already have because such a size and scale of population could not occur without them. This, in fact, is what advocates of sustainability seem to want. They don't like advanced technology, at least as an abstract principle. They want a simpler, less technological life, perhaps even going backwards somewhat from the level we have reached already. And indeed, we probably would go backward if we stopped growing. There is such a thing as the second law of thermodynamics, such a thing as entropy, which says that an isolated system tends towards disorder, to decay, to running down. And the fact is that older technologies are less efficient. In the evolution of stone tools, the later ones got over a hundred times as much cutting edge from a given piece of flint. To put it the other way round, the earlier ones used a hundred times as much flint for a given amount of cutting edge. They would consume stone at a hundred times the rate of the later ones. It is that very prodigality that is a factor in technological advance. People are effort minimizers, which is to say they are lazy. And that is only logical. Organisms that unnecessarily expend effort will not survive long in the competition of life. People will use stone in easy, wasteful ways until resulting scarcity forces them to become more efficient. Technological progress exhibits what Buckminster Fuller, the inventor of the geodesic dome, called ephemeralization, or doing more with less. One only needs to compare the iPhone with the notorious bricks of the 1980s Today's phone is far lighter in its impact on the planet, so by trying to stop technological development and economic growth, we will burn through the Earth's resources more quickly. Ironically, actions taken in the name of sustainability will ensure our way of life is less sustainable than it might be. To return to the main point, humanity at this point can take one of two paths continue growing, developing and expanding at an accelerating pace, which necessarily means moving off this planet and tapping the resources of outer space, or cease to grow and stagnate on planet Earth, which in fact means shrinking numbers and going backwards to simpler, older standards of living. From a cosmic perspective, stagnating on a small planet in a corner of the galaxy looks very much like failure. But to the sustainability movement, it is an objective, the direction in which the human race ought to be moving. It almost looks as though the human race is indeed heading for such cosmic failure. The late public health professor Hans Rosling showed how the global population is stabilising as birth rates everywhere fall to the replacement level of one child per person. Since population grows because of technological innovation, that means we can support more people on the same land area, the fact that global population growth is now tailing off could be seen as saying that technology is no longer growing and delivering the gains it once did. Instead of living through an especially innovative time, 
the stabilizing demographics suggest we may be being less innovative than we ought to be, or at least than we were in the recent past. So if we look at the population of the world, it seems to have been increasing exponentially and out of control. But if we look at a country like Britain, we see what looks more like a logistic curve. There was a spurt of population growth in the 18th and 19th centuries, which can be linked to the process of industrialization and which is now running out of steam. As the rest of the world has been catching up with industrialization, it has been going through the same growth spurt. But once everywhere has industrialized, the world population chart should come to resemble that of Britain. And that's what Hans Rosling seemed to be finding. Yet, despite the power of the sustainability movement's voice in the world today, and despite this seeming evidence that it is being successful at exerting a break on human progress, I think it is unlikely to get its way in the long run. This stabilisation and stagnation of the human population is probably a temporary thing, and growth will accelerate again when there is another wave of innovation comparable to that of industrialization. In fact, if we look more closely at the UK population from the mid 20th century, we see that it does seem to have taken off again on a new logistic curve in line with the revolution in computers and electronics. We seem to be looking at the switchover from Grinin's industrial production principle to his information scientific production principle. Hans Rosling's data show the final stages of the industrial cycle on a global level, while a look close up at the more advanced parts of the world reveals the beginning stages of the new information scientific cycle. We should expect more dramatic upward movements as this spreads and develops with the colonization of space in particular. So activists, academics, politicians and diplomats may be telling us that there are too many of us, that we are destroying the planet and that we need to rein in our ambitions. But the inventors and entrepreneurs are, as we have seen, pressing ahead anyway. The fact is that humanity has been on this accelerating curve of living ever larger and more expensively for tens of thousands of years. It looks a good bet that this is the way things work. Technology has progressed because of people's desire for a more comfortable life. Anyone who has tried to kindle a flame using two sticks can tell you that notwithstanding the romantic pleasures of sitting around a campfire, it is much nicer to be able to come home and turn on the central heating and get good quality light at the flick of a switch. Humanity as a whole seeks comfort and that is why we are likely to move forward, not backward, levelling up to become a fully-fledged space civilization, first in the confines of our solar system, and eventually, for the same reasons that we leave the Earth, onward to other star systems and throughout the galaxy. As we do so, the concerns that drive calls for sustainability will fade into irrelevance. Environmentalists worry about there being too many people and about running out of energy and natural resources. But in space, as is already obvious and will become even clearer once we're up there, there is plenty of room for almost any size of human population, vast amounts of solar energy and abundant planets to exploit for their raw materials, some of them hundreds of times larger than Earth. In space, the human race can undergo another hockey stick leap upwards in population, knowledge and dynamism. Earth will be seen, in the words of Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin, as just our starting point, our cradle that we left once we were out of our infancy. Now, I said that the conquest of space will absorb the human labour that is displaced by automation and robotics. But if AI can substitute for humans here on Earth, why won't it do so in space as well? The answer is that space exploration will present challenges we cannot yet imagine. There are what Donald Rumsfeld called the unknown unknowns, things we don't know we don't know 
We think we know what's up there in space, as after all we have explored it with our space probes, and we assume that what we know from here on Earth covers pretty much all there is to know about the rest of the universe. However, human knowledge has been growing century after century. There is no logical reason to suppose that we happen to be living in the time when we have come to know pretty much everything there is to know. In fact, that is just ridiculous when you consider what a tiny portion of space and time we have had direct experience of. The reality is that we are probably in for some huge surprises and we cannot construct an AI to deal with problems and situations we don't even know exist yet. That is going to take human ingenuity and adaptability. AI will be there to help them, but humans will do what they do best, coping with the unexpected, deciding on objectives and priorities, and using their moral judgment to resolve dilemmas. It might also be worth mentioning that space is a hostile and unforgiving environment for creatures that have evolved on a planet's surface. It is going to present a level of danger humans have never encountered before, and the initial stages of our movement through the solar system are likely to prove costly in terms of human lives. So this is what we are looking at during the rest of this century, a growing importance of both space travel and AI in human affairs, culminating in the onset of a sweeping technological revolution two or three decades from now, when the whole nature of human work will change and there will be accompanying transformation of social institutions, probably involving much political and economic upheaval. This new epoch, corresponding to stage three of Grinin's information scientific innovation cycle, will see humans beginning their transition towards being what is known as a Kardashev II species, one that operates at the level of a solar system rather than that of a single planet. One aspect of the social and political changes that accompany this technological revolution will be the ending of the free and easy internet we enjoy today. Information technologies are associated with gains in human freedom. It is no coincidence that the invention of printing was followed by the revolutionary ideas of both Copernicus and Martin Luther with their challenges to the traditional control of the church over society and human thought. Similarly, it is said that the fax and photocopier contributed to the downfall of the Soviet Union, as they made it easier to spread underground literature, contradicting the claims of the Communist Party and revealing the fundamental problems of Soviet society. Nevertheless, these gains of freedom are only of a partial kind, as the political authorities and economic elites tend to catch up with the implications of the new technology and regulate and exploit it for their own purposes. When printing became cheap and ubiquitous in the 17th century, there was a proliferation of pamphleteering. These often anonymous publications spread social criticism and dangerous ideas and were a threat to the state to institutions and to prominent individuals. These powerful actors then fought back using the libel laws and government censorship to bring the pamphleteers under control. While pamphleteering declined, in the 18th century newspapers became places for criticising the elite and challenging official views of the world. Over time, though, the newspaper industry was concentrated in the hands of a few powerful proprietors taking particular editorial lines, and newspapers' role in rocking the boat and promoting a diversity of opinion declined. The internet has so far been characterised by intellectual anarchy, with bloggers and YouTubers able to get their opinions out to the world bypassing traditional gatekeepers like publishing companies and television studios who previously controlled what people could watch and read. Every shade of opinion is represented. Every interest, every perversion can gain attention and promote itself. Ordinary people can interact with each other far and wide, from buying and selling on eBay to commenting on forums, 
finding out easily what others are thinking and doing. At the same time, leakers and hackers are exposing elite secrets and making them widely available, such as the exposure of important people's offshore finances in the Panama Papers scandal. All this Wild West activity on the internet makes it more difficult for those in authority to shape opinion, which limits their ability to pursue policies that, as they might put it, are in the public interest but difficult to sell, for example, launching overseas wars. Worse than that, it raises the risk of rebellion as causes of discontent are publicised and protests can be coordinated. In some countries, like China and Saudi Arabia, censorship is already extensive and blatant. In the West, though, we are also seeing a move towards censorship of online content. This is in the name of combating cyber victimization, bullying and trolling, as well as controlling access to pornography and preventing the spread of foreign political propaganda, so-called fake news, alleged to be confusing domestic populations and subverting democratic decision-making. Governments are doing this not merely by passing laws against such activities, but by threatening large fines and perhaps other punishments for online portals such as Facebook and Twitter if their services are found to be carrying the offending material. Such threats will naturally make these providers err on the side of caution, so that censorship extends beyond the kind of content nominally being targeted. Meanwhile, it may seem as though the internet cuts out intermediaries like publishers and studios, letting people communicate directly with the public. But in fact, online content is carried through intermediaries such as search engines, e-commerce sites and social networking apps. These intermediaries are being whittled down to ever smaller numbers. In the late 90s, in the early days of the World Wide Web, there were numerous search engines, Excite, Lycos, Alta Vista, but today there is pretty much only one, to the extent it has created a verb to Google. And what algorithm Google uses to return search results is proprietary information. We have little idea what might be being filtered out. Some is, for sure. I, for one, have noticed that in New Zealand, where restrictions are fewer, it is possible to find ripped-off copies of e-books that do not appear in search results in the UK. It's not just a case of censoring illicit material. Google makes its money by advertising and it has an incentive to tweak its search results to enhance the revenue of its advertisers or of itself. The same goes for sites like Facebook, eBay and Amazon when they bring certain things to our attention or suggest other things we might like to buy. We have no idea what they are specifically promoting and what they are blocking. We have no idea how we might be being manipulated. So while the internet has sidelined some traditional intermediaries like publishers, studios, high street retailers and even banks with things like peer-to-peer -peer lending, it has permitted the rise of intermediaries on an even more gigantic scale. These sites, Google, Amazon, Facebook, know a huge amount about us, from the things we search for, the things we buy, the messages we send, and the people we connect with. And you can be sure the government does as well. Those spy agencies do not absorb billions of pounds of public funding for nothing. Throughout history, the technologies that empower ordinary people also empower the authorities, leading to a perpetual arms race and dynamic equilibrium. The motor car helps criminals get away, and it helps the police chase after them. Electronic communications make it easier to spread subversive or illicit material and plot criminal actions but they also help intelligence agencies to detect such activity and profile every member of the population. So with the monopoly power of online corporations along with government censorship and surveillance, the free and easy internet we have become accustomed to is going to turn into something much more restricted and controlled. There will be less content, less debate, more things will have to be paid for at least if we want the best and latest services. 
the sharing libertarian utopia envisaged by some internet activists such as the Electronic Frontier Foundation will become less not more of a reality and traditional political and economic structures will reassert themselves online. This is not going to happen immediately, it will unfold over the next 20 to 25 years on the same timescale as the rise of AI and the first large-scale colonization of space. It might be expected that there will be resistance to this and that the bloggers and vloggers will continue to offer their critiques of governments and mainstream media, while any attempts to charge for services like search and chat will be deterred by the huge backlash that would provoke. However, the process is likely to be facilitated by the coming global war of national survival. For one thing, the war will justify all kinds of extension of government power. For another, much of the existing internet will be destroyed by cyber warfare, if not nuclear attack, so that the existing services will disappear anyway, and can then be rebuilt along more monetized lines. At any rate, after 2040, with the arrival of Grinin's Stage 3, the full revolutionary effects of the information scientific technological cycle will be in place, and it will be clear that humanity has moved into a different era, not just technologically but sociologically too. Whereas today's world looks, at a glance, not much different from that of the last few decades, after 2040, when 70% of existing jobs are done by robots, when millions of people live in orbiting space cities, and when society is dominated by intrusive governments and giant info corporations, people will be living in a world that looks unmistakably like science fiction. So that's what's coming over the next few decades. And what about after that? Where is humanity headed longer term? I will just point the way to three developments that will be hugely transforming over the centuries to come. The first is the further exploration of space. By 2040, Jeff Bezos's millions of people living and working in space will be mostly in near-Earth orbit. This, however, will be just the beginning, and subsequent decades will see us reaching out to other planets and their moons, settling both the surface and the surrounding orbital regions. Beyond that, we will start the journey to other stars, and this is something that is going to require fundamental new scientific discoveries. Our existing physics makes journey time so prohibitive that an interstellar civilization is impossible. That physics, if the past is any guide, is at best incomplete and in some respects flat out wrong. At some time, there is going to be a major shift of perspective and what we currently call science will come to seem as misguided and naive as the science of the ancient Greeks seems to us. That shift of perspective will allow us to realise the technologies of Star Trek and Star Wars. I say if the past is any guide because hitherto our ingenuity has allowed us to make real things that once seemed magical and imaginary like air travel and video calling. The past tells us that humanity pursues its dreams and in the long run makes them come true. One Star Trek technology that may be related to the breakthrough to interstellar travel is matter transportation, beaming people from one place to another. This will come. Scientists have already achieved teleportation of a single quantum state over nearly a hundred miles. They have also managed to teleport two quantum states simultaneously and think the method could be stretched to three quantum states. Of course, to transmit a macroscopic entity like a human being, they would have to teleport countless gazillions of quantum states. But we know that human affairs are characterised by hockey sticks, slow, imperceptible progress, followed by the sky's the limit. So going from one, two, three quantum states to gazillions is just how technology works. Developing macroscopic teleportation is not going to be easy, but among the vast population of a space-going civilization, there will be a few geniuses who make the necessary breakthroughs, 
and there will be the energy and resources to turn it into a practical technology. I should mention that many reports of the existing work on quantum teleportation emphasise that it has nothing to do with matter transportation and even go so far as to claim that matter transportation will never be a reality. They say that transmitting quantum states is not the same as disintegrating a material object, beaming its contents to another place and putting it back together again. This reflects a lack of understanding. It's a bit like saying a telephone does not permit communication at a distance because it is not your actual voice, not the actual sound waves that are transferred. The fact is that it is not the actual atoms in a person's body that define that person because the atoms in our bodies are changing all the time. What matters is the state of those atoms, so it is not necessary to transmit the actual atoms in order to transmit the person, but it is necessary to transmit their quantum states and to do so very accurately. So quantum teleportation is indeed directly relevant to the kind of matter transportation we see in Star Trek. Of course, this raises all sorts of philosophical questions as to whether an exact replica of me is the same as me and many people say they would never put themselves through such a device. However, my prediction is that from a subjective perspective, matter transportation will work, in that it will feel as though you have been transmitted, and people will eventually become comfortable with this technology. And then think how that will change things. Here on Earth, cars and roads will cease to exist, along with trains, buses and aeroplanes. All the space currently given over to tarmac can return to greenery. Go shopping in New York, visit your cousin in Australia. It will be as easy as walking into the next room. Someone trying to mug or harass you, just teleport away. Distance will cease to matter, and this will require fundamentally new cultural institutions to manage our social activities and relationships. And this brings us to the third transforming development of the medium to long term future. That is the disappearance of gender as a human characteristic. Humans will stop being divided into males and females, differentiated by their reproductive roles and associated secondary characteristics. And babies will stop being born live from women's bodies. That will come to seem intensely primitive and barbaric. Our whole relationship with our bodies will change. Will we even have bodies? What will happen to sex? I don't know. What I feel sure of is that gender will cease to be a factor in human affairs. If you think I am going out on a limb here, consider that gender is already under attack, challenged both conceptually and in practical terms. Gender is seen as problematic, even illegitimate. And this is why we can expect that in the long run, future generations will bring about its eradication. So there you have it. That is what is coming. After 2040, probably following a catastrophic war, stage three of the present technological wave involving a massive displacement of human activity through the proliferation of AI and the move into space. While the online services that increasingly define our world become more politically repressive and economically exploitative. And in the longer term, even more fundamental changes in society and in what it means to be human, involving scientific and technological innovations that present day science would reject as impossible. And we can predict this on the basis that the way things have been for 50,000 years is the way they will continue to be and that the things we see unfolding today will continue to unfold to their logical conclusion. And so it is more of a stretch, more implausible, more like special pleading to suppose that these things won't come to pass than to suppose that they will.